Hello, my name is Tracy Ferguson, and I'm going to talk about the Stockdale Paradox. The first thing I need to do is to define the Stockdale Paradox. It's a theory that states that you must retain faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. And at the same time, you must also confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. And this theory was named after Admiral Jim Stockdale. He was the highest ranking U.S. military officer in the Hanoi Hilton prison of war camp during the height of the Vietnam War. He was tortured for over 20, um, t over 20 times during about eight years imprisonment from 1965 to 1973 with no uh, prisoner rights or any expected release date or even knowing whether he'd ever see his family again or even get out of prison alive. And he was also the first three-star officer in Navy to wear an aviator wings and Congressional Medal of Honor. And after his whole um, situation was over and he finally got out, he ended up studying philosophy at Stanford. Some of the tactics that he used while he was uh, in prison were he beat himself up one time to avoid looking like he was a well-treated prisoner. He also uh, wrote letters to his wife and exchanged intelligence information even though he knew it would cause uh, further bad treatment or even, even maybe death. Um, he came up with a system that gave rules for torture to, for the prisoners because no one can resist torture indefinitely. So he gave them like a step system saying, you know, after you've gone this far, then you can say this. Uh, he came up with an internal communication system using taps for different letters uh, for the, of the alphabet and this is the way they communicated because they always tried to uh, keep them in isolation. And one of the things that I thought that was real interesting was that uh, when interviewed he said that the optimists always died because in prison they had a lot of prisoners that would say you know well we're gonna be out by Christmas and then when Christmas came, then they'd be disappointed. Or they say, well, we're going to be out by Easter or New Year's. And every time they reached that time point and they didn't get out, then they'd be disappointed and heartbroken. And he said, those are the people that died. Now, I want to talk about how this applies to generate, managing, and align the resources in schools. One thing I want to say before I move a little bit further is about, you know, he talked, when we look at the optimists saying the optimists died, this is something that relates to businesses because they talked about in the reading how the optimists, those are the ones that those type companies and those type managers in companies or even you want to think about schools and educational systems, those are the ones that ended up failing in the end. But talking about generating resources in regard to this theory, I thought about when they talk about being honest, you have to be honest about what resources that you have that are depleted. Which ones that you cannot go back to or you cannot keep depending on. If you know you're out of money in this fund or that fund or this uh, business that's supporting your school system, you have these partnerships with businesses. Once you know these are over, you need to move on and get out and try to start developing new relationships with other businesses or to try to find new avenues of getting out and generating and, uh, with new stakeholders. And also, you have to face this with personnel, too. I think human capital is one of the biggest um, areas of concern or resources that we have because sometimes people really just are not performing uh, well. And even when we try to do as much as we possibly can to build them up, sometimes it does not work or they're not a right fit for our organization or our school. So I think we have to be honest with that, and we're talking about when we're talking about generating resources, uh, even with um, f recruiting employees or teachers or personnel. And the second part is managing resources. Um, I've come into uh, the realization that with the school system, a lot of times we start initiatives and they really don't work, but for some reason we keep going. We don't evaluate them. We don't revise them. We just keep going and keep going whether they're um, helpful or not. 
So I think also we need to face the truth about that. When initiatives don't work, and we see they don't work, regardless of who brought them in or who suggested them, we need to end those initiatives because our objective is to educate students and promote them to the next level. And when we're using a resource that's not doing that, then we need to stop it or step back and reevaluate it. Um, another regard, regard when you're talking about managing is like we, I said a few minutes ago, to be honest about member comp contribution regardless of politics or prejudice. When you think about just the day I was observing a teacher, and if, if it would have been somebody that I liked or somebody that I knew that was friends with a board member or something like that, you can't let those type of things affect your organizations and its performance. You have to observe people and be honest about their performance and the same thing with hiring a lot of times uh, pressure external pressure or even maybe internal pressure you experience about you need to hire this person because they're somebody's friend you need to be honest about those type things too because you want to always hire the best fit for the organization and as far as resources go the flex budget ex was one of the uh, most difficult and most learning uh, opportunities I've had to experience when you're dealing with uh, budgets and line items, you have to use discipline because you cannot, um, you have to face the truth about that. You cannot think or override guidelines to say you could only use this money for this line item or this area or this resource. So you have to be very careful how you do that. And you have to be honest with yourself and your organization and your members. It should really be a joint effort, I think, um, as much as possible. Bring in the team, um, department heads, and get buy-in and input from the organization as a whole to determine where those resources and allocations need to be made. Another thing was like we have a technology grant with our school, and when you start initiatives, you need to look at how you're going to be able to maintain them once those allocations that gave you the ability to start them have depleted. So like now we have all these uh, iPads and MacBooks that we have to figure out how we're going to maintain them, keep them upgraded and fixed and in working order once this grant is over in June. So I thought those were some ways that um, this uh, stock their par paradox uh, related to generating, managing, and aligning resources in schools. The next thing is how uh, the stock their paradox connects, supports, and aligns to theory and research within the field of education and leadership. Um, I read some theory from um, Charette, I think that's how you pronounce his name, and he says, Get the most out of your failures. And I thought that was profound. Because it kind of supports the theory with Stockdale because Stockdale says that, you know, have your have faith and, and kind of like keep marching on and have these guidelines for yourself where you make these, uh, understand that you can only stand so much and then you have to do something different or make another step. And you have to learn as you go along facing the truth once again and believing that you will prevail. And in order to do that, you have to make the most out of your failures. You have to learn from them and, and, and figure out uh, what you can do to change and be honest with yourself about what was a failure and why it was a failure. Was it within your fault? Was it something that you should have been able to control? Something you should have been able to see beforehand? It's just a lot about, you know, failures aren't always a bad thing because you can learn from them. It's like by taking risks and and trying to promote the uh, school and the organization and the learning level to the next level, but you have to be honest about it. I thought another theory that the military used um, that will re relate to this would be, they call it hot wash ups. And it's whenever they make decisions, they go back and debate them, review them, they look at them again, uh, they revise them, and they try to figure out analyzing them exactly what happened and what was going on and being very honest about it. And, and they call it a hot wash up because it turns into like a hot debate where everybody gets involved in talking about what actually happened and coming up with answers on why it happened to make it a good fix for it. And I think that's something that goes along with being brutally honest and that could be applied to the school system. And 
uh, I think it was Bill Engel, uh, talked about what our role is in those we choose to educate. You know, a lot of times you have to be honest about what it is you can do, what it is you have the power and the ability to do when you're talking about educating students and things that you can do in um in the school system. I tell teachers all the time, don't make threats that you can't carry out, that you don't have the power to do. A lot of times teachers tell students, I'm going to suspend you if you do this. Teachers don't have the power to suspend. Only administrators have that power. And the same thing with principals. Principals will say, you know, uh, APs anyway, or coordinators will say, well, I'm going to have you long term. Well, you don't have the power within yourself to long term a student. That's something that has to be passed by the superintendent. So I think that's important too with the school system along with talking about again being honest, being honest about what it is you can actually do. And something that connected to theory for me was the motivation factor within the school system. Transformation and leadership, it talks about how it connects with this thought that paradox is it talks about being honest. Being honest when you're dealing with um, your colleagues and being honest that you know, there's no real way of motivating people. And when you think about it, I think about it with students and, and with personnel um, because <clears throat> you have to do the best you can to try to align the vision and mission and objectives of your school with the intrinsic needs of, <coughs> excuse me, your personnel. And this is how you motivate people. This is how you truly you're not really motivating them, but you're put, aligning things in a manner where they'll be able to motivate themselves. So I thought that was important. And in conclusion, uh, I came out with these points. Effectively dealing with problems and surprises. That's part of the thought there paradox because it's talking about current reality. What's going on right now? What has popped up? What kind of problem are we having? We got to look at these things for what they really are. We can't shove them up under the rug and pretend they're not going on in our school. The pink elephant in the room. Our math department's not collaborating and you know we're just going to pretend that's not happening. You got to face these things and work to figure out how you can uh, move on through them. Absolute belief in what you are doing, but honest in forming that belief. Uh, that's the faith part with the start there paradox. Um, you got to believe in what you're doing, but you got to be honest with yourself about what you are doing and about your beliefs in it. Um, one of the saddest things I had to face in um, education years and years and years ago when I first started teaching was that I can't save everybody. And that was a very hurtful thing for me. Because I, when I first started teaching, I felt like I was superwoman. I was going to be able to reach everybody and do everything and come in and make these big changes in students' lives. And some of them I won't be able to reach. Somebody else may be able to reach them, but it's, it's a possibility I won't be able to reach them. And you have leaders coming into organizations wanting to make these big shifts and these big moves. And they have to realize that, you know, they say it takes three to five years to facilitate real change and lasting change at that and so leaders have to believe that and understand they have to believe in their mission and what they want trying to do but they also have to be honest in the formation of that belief of based on what they can do and the next one is being failure tolerant I read about this too constructive failure is accepted and worthy you can be a win and you can win in your failure and still prevail relating to start their paradox prevailing Believing that in the end you're going to prevail. Even though I lost this little battle here, I learned from it, and I know what to do next time, and it's going to help me win the war in the end. And the last thing, point, is do not make the same mistakes over and over again expecting a different result. Facing the truth, back again with Start There Paradox. you got to face the truth. If it didn't work the first time, most likely it's not going to work the second time. And they call it insanity by continuing to do these same thing and expecting a different result and that goes along with facing the truth too so um, I, I think all this uh, start their paradox directly aligns with uh, educational leadership and within not just the head leader or the principal but in teacher leadership and student leadership and facilitating uh, leadership and building leadership in, within your organization and I think that's all I have. Thank you. 
And last slide are my references.